Thank you. <laughs> Caller number 4255, you're on the air. Do you have a question? I'm just listening as well, enjoying the show. Griff, put it down as always. Thank you. Okay. All right. Our listeners. Caller number 5630, you're on the air. Do you have a question for Professor Griff? Uh, peace. Um, peace and balance to everybody. Yes, I do want to ask Professor Griff, um, and all of us, I want to say respect to Professor Griff as well as Public Enemy for everything that they actually put forth for us. Uh, my question is, I wanted to know, during the days of Public Enemy, if you actually noticed a lot of these things going on during that time, like were you aware of all of the, um, basically, I mean, were you aware of all the bullshit that's actually taking place? The stuff that we can see now is, is, is I think, is far more vivid. But I just want to know, being inside, directly inside the business, were you able to see it? Um, I really appreciate your question, sister. And, yes, I've seen it. Um, and as Minister of Information, it was my duty and job inside of the context of Public Enemy to pass this information on to Chuck and the Bomb Squad so when we made the songs, we could put this information in the songs. Are you following me? Um, surprisingly enough, uh, even inside of the context of the group, I had to battle with individuals to get this kind of information out. They were fighting me tooth and nail. This is why at a certain period of time, uh, they got rid of me. Now, sister, I want you to sit back and put on your seatbelt for a second. I talk about human sacrifice and blood rituals, right? But check this out, which I've never really said before, sister. Professor Griff was supposed to be public enemy's blood human sacrifice. I was supposed to be dead by now, according to them. Are you following me? Wow. Hello? Uh, so we have to understand, I'm not supposed to be on the scene now. After what I was doing in Public Enemy, um, I had I took the power and started revealing who these people were. Right at that time, sister, they got rid of my black ass. Shortly after that, Chuck got a job with Fox. And this is no, no negative attack on Chuck D. I love the brother. But Chuck got a job with Fox, and then he got the job with Air America. All right? Then, shortly after that, Flavor Flay started doing reality shows. I'm not saying that was the payoff, but I'm saying I wasn't supposed to be around now. But let me tell you what happened prior to that. When I started revealing these things, I studied a book called The Octopus. Go look this book up. Go look up a man by the name of John Todd. John, T-O-D-D, -D, John Todd. Go to um, your YouTube, put in his name. I started revealing that they were taking the masters. After we finished with the music, they were taking the masters into the sacred chamber. And I'm not making this up, sister. They would take, uh, take the masters. They would go into the sacred chamber. They would put the master on an altar, and they would do uh, not only blood rituals with it, but they would go through these satanic rituals with the master, giving the, the master a, a certain kind of frequency. So every song that would, would be played on the airways, control, uh, controlled by them, right, would have this demonic frequency to it. And when I started revealing that, the brothers in Public Enemy got rid of my ass. I got poisoned in 1990. Ended up on a goddamn slab in Wimbledon, England. Wife left me and divorced me for whatever reason. Shit, you can call her and ask her that. Got back. I got well, thanks to some Rastafarian brothers. Got back to America. Uh, got uh, dropped from the label. Got sued. Uh, ended up broke once again and had to go for self. Are you following me? At the same time, people with higher, high-powered rifles were trying, trying to take my life at Def Jam. Are you following me? So we have to understand this. So, yeah, I was telling it, but from inside of Public Enemy, I got silenced. So after that, I got signed to Luke, who was doing the booty shake thing, and you know goddamn well I wasn't with that shit. Excuse my language. But guess who hooked that deal up, sister? Chuck D hooked that deal up. I wasn't looking for no damn record deal. I wasn't a recording artist at the time. I was a minister of information. 
But Chuck D hooked that deal up, and that's how I ended up making those three albums. Um, Pause in the Game, which I read a book by William Cooper called Pause in the Game, and please go read the book, who laid out the whole account. I mean, he laid out the daily and dialectic principle and told you who are the players in this Illuminati thing. So I named my album after his book. The second album I made was called Chaos to Wisdom. Because I wanted to bring brothers that were uh, paying attention to me at the time from a chaotic state into some kind of wisdom. So I called it Chaos and Rise the Dome. Are you following me? My third album was Disturbing the Peace, which your friend, Ludacris, Luda, could not believe that all the titles that he used on his Disturbing the Peace project with his groups and his label and all that come directly off of my album. He spelled it the same way in the whole bit. My fourth album was Blood of the Prophet. It was Blood of the P-R-O-F-I-T, not Blood of the Prophet, like the messenger. Are you following me? The next album after that I did with uh, Chuck D and a friend Kyle Jason called Confrontation Camp. Objects in the mirror are closer than they appear. And the three or four albums I made after that were on my own. The G.O.D. project was uh, Great Oracle Dialects. And then I did my band's album was the seventh octave. And the first album was Seven Degree. And I'm on the uh, I'm on my second album now with my band called The God Damage. So, yeah, since I've been telling it, oh, I forgot one album, damn. Uh, I did a poetry spoken word album, this Global Arts album, called um, And the Word Became Flesh on a label called Lethal Records out of New York, which was actually Blackheart, no, Lethal Records, Blackheart, which was owned by Joan Jett and the Blackhearts, and uh, Mercury Records. I did one album uh, there, and I did one album for um, for uh, Capitol Records, which was the, the Spoken Word album. So I was, I've been telling it, sister, but Public Enemy assisted in them shutting me down, and I had to go for self. So at that time, it wasn't about making music. It was about saving my life. I hope I wasn't long-winded on that. Mm. All right. Um, we're going to uh, take another call. Um, caller number 9457, you're on the air. Do you have a question for Professor Griff? Uh, <clears throat> yeah. How you doing, Griff? Peace, God. Peace, peace, peace. I just want to know... Um, when you talk about the industry and all these cats, you know what I mean, like the major cats just making all this money and they're into the rituals, um, do you think they are really aware that they sold out to the devil in a sense? Or is it kind of like, like I kind of hard, find it hard to believe that like Jay-Z, I don't find it hard to believe, I know it's real, but like he's consciously worshiping the devil. You know what I mean? I know they know they might be involved in something deep. I know they've they definitely gotta know that they've lost a part of themselves. Do you think these dudes are really sitting around knowing actually and fully what they're involved in and doing it and consciously destroying their own people on some real malignant evil awareness? No, it's not presented to them in that way. Just like the ritual that I went over in sports and, and, and religion. The sports players don't think that they're doing anything wrong. LeBron James, when I, I, when I do my lecture, I show that slide with him and the white woman on, on the cover of Vogue. The horns on top of his head. It was brought to his attention that I said this. And you know what he said? He said that little MF don't know what he's talking about. And then we put the King Kong next to it with the white woman in the same pose. And we asked him, what did he think? And he says he doesn't see anything wrong with it. He's proud to be on the cover of Vogue. So the way it's presented to them, are you following me? Yeah. Just like in the Lord of the Rings, in basketball you receive a ring. Am I right or wrong? Right. And the leaders of these countries got to go to Europe and kiss the ring. Are you following me? Yeah. Well, if you do deeper science in what the ring is, then it'll let you know it's a ritual. It's not hard to figure out. It's not hard to figure out. Now, does, does Jay Z and the rest of these cats know that they're outright worshiping the devil? Probably not. When it's been brought to their attention, they scratch their head and they say, well, look, man, I'm paid. That's all this is about. Griffiths is jealous. Griffiths is envious. Griffiths, he's bitter. Griffiths. 
a motherfucker doing whatever. Right, so my next question is, are they hearing this stuff? Like, are they hearing this stuff like we're talking about now? Let me, uh, you, bro. Yeah? And let me tell you the people that I ran into since I've been dropping this. I was at Def Jam's 25th anniversary with VH1. Ja Rule, As- uh, Asante, Method Man, Red Man, um... I could go on, man. Everybody on Def Jam's label, from Wale to The Roots, from I run into all kind of people, uh, uh, all kind of people. I just recently, st- uh, starting recently, the other night, I ran into Andre 3000. And you just smiled, shook my hand, gave me a hug, said, listen, man, I'm listening. I'm listening. Keep doing what you're doing, man. I'm listening to you. That kind of stuff. I ran into Shaq. I ran into um, to other people. Um, Different movie stars in in Hollywood. I run into these people, man. And all they can do is wink, shake my hand, give me a hug, pat me on the back, say, "We listening, man. We checking you out." You know, I don't agree with all that stuff, but you putting it down. Do your thing, man. Are you following me? I was just at Raheem Devon. Big ups to Raheem Devon. He called me and invited me to do the Soul Train Music Awards with him and Ludacris. Are you following me? Raheem Devon says, "You may not know, man, but..." People that you don't think are listening are listening to you. And he, he went and he said, yo, some other people listening to you too. And I said, okay. Everywhere I go, man, these people don't say anything to me. They don't want to argue with me. They don't debate with me because it's not me. My ego is not in this, bro. It ain't no big I and little you. My motto, and people that know me will tell you, my motto is everything for everyone and nothing for ourselves. I'm going to say it again slow. Everything for everyone. And nothing ourselves. There's no big I and little you. Are you following me? I am because we are. Therefore, I am. My ego is not in this. If I was, if I was a double dutch championship king or whatever the hell, I'd be telling it there. If I played ping pong, I'd be doing it there. Are you following me? If I was a school teacher, a construction worker, I'd still be telling the truth on Blog Talk Radio or Sister Isis program. It don't make me a damn bit of difference. It's just that the music industry chose me, and I chose to tell it. Plain and simple. And I've been telling it since the time I did the interview back in 1989 with David Mills with Surgeon's first chapter of my book called Analytics. Ever since then, I've been telling it. And people have been after me, trying to kill me and wanting to silence me. Let them bring it, man. Shit. Let them bring it. I ain't never had no damn fear. Are you following me? So I'm going right. so to reiter- reiterate this to you, brother. And I don't mean to raise my voice. But I was supposed to be that blood sacrifice for public enemy. But I refuse to die. Because they can't do nothing with Griff. It's out of my hands now. Are you following me? Somebody... Somewhere got to be a real damn man and stand the hell up and speak truth to power and tell the truth the way it is. Whether I lose my life or not, it means nothing to me. Are you following me? We're going to die sooner or later right along. Right. So I'm telling all the damn evil doers, bring it. Come on. I'm going to call the damn devil out. You see, my father told me to be like David. And if you study David's prayers in the Bible, David prayed for the destruction of his enemies. I'm not praying for my damn enemy. Let him bring it. Let him, let him, let him okay. bring it. I'm calling the evil doers out. Let them bring it, man. I don't care if they come in a, in a black skin, white skin, on a spiritual tip, physical tip. It don't make me a better damn difference. Bring it. Right. Um, okay, uh, I'm going to, let's see, I'm going to take a, another caller. Um, let's see, hold on for a minute. Let's see here. Caller number 6490, you're on the air. Do you have a question for Professor Griff? Yes, I do. First of all, respect to Sister Isis and the uh, show. I think it's, uh, it's it's truly amazing how you get this information out there like that. Um Second of all, respect to Professor Griff. Uh, Blood of the Prophet was was, a, was an amazing album, so I wanted to just, you know, I always wanted to take the opportunity to say that to you. Thank you. 
um, my question is this. Um, I'm, a, I'm an educator myself. I teach uh, college courses, and um, one of the classes I teach is called Psychological Perspectives in Hip-Hop. We do this whole week on, on language, you know what I'm saying, in hip-hop and how it's used for good and for, um, you know, for evil. Uh, I've heard you speak on this before.